If I haven't had an opportunity to meet you at some point, my name is Dave Valoni. I'm the senior associate pastor here at River Oak. And Pastor Heath will be back with us next Sunday morning to start his new sermon series for the new year. And we're excited about that. But let me just say this. We are thrilled that you've chosen to worship with us here this morning. There is no place I think that I'd rather be than with God's people on the first Sunday of the new year. Amen? Isn't it great? And let's give the Lord another round of applause for that worship this morning. I... Those guys always do such a great job. They always do such a great job, and it was just a great way to start off the new year today. Well, listen, I'm going to buck a little bit of a trend as I start this sermon today. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but on my social media feed, just about everybody's talking about having 2020 vision, you know, as they go into the new year. And there's pastors all over America today that have entitled their sermon 2020 vision. They've been waiting months to be able to, to, to lay this out. Well, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm, we're going to talk from the book of Ecclesiastes today a little bit about how life really is. A little bit about uh, reality, the here and now. And then see um, how we can apply that in our lives to uh, the end of the as we go throughout 2020. One of the things that um, I've seen in looking at this book is this idea of what's meaningless and what's not. And let's just look at this before we even get going. In chapter 1 of ver- verse 2 of uh, Ecclesiastes, this is what it says. The author of the book says, he's, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Now the preacher there is King Solomon. Okay, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That same word that's translated vanity here could also be translated meaningless. So what's he saying? Meaningless, 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 meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Great way to start the new year, Pastor Dave. I'm really excited and encouraged now. Well, I think there is hope in this message. There's a lot of hope in the book of Ecclesiastes. But you've got to work, walk through some of the hard realities of life first. Um, you know, the book of Ecclesiastes is actually a pretty interesting book. It's pretty popular. I may be kind of giving away my age a little bit, but uh, how many of you guys remember a, a singing group from the 60s called The Birds? Remember the birds? Look at that. We had a few folks, right? Um, the, the old song, turn, 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 to everything there's a season, turn, turn, turn. Straight out of the book of Ecclesiastes. Some of you guys in your weddings, um, you had the whole phrase, a threefold cord is not easily broken, right out of Ecclesiastes. Some say there's a time to mourn, there's a time to, to dance, a time to, of joy, um, there's a season for everything. That's right out of Ecclesiastes. So even secular sources often turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm actually intrigued by the book because I think, as some other commentators have said too, that it might be the book that has the most modern themes in it. When you read through the book and you look at Solomon's analysis of how life really is, he's, he, he addresses everything that we struggle with today. It's super interesting the way that he goes from one thing to the next in life. And in fact, I'm going to be doing a 10-week Bible study through the book of Ecclesiastes on Wednesday nights at 6.30. And I'd invite any of you that, that have these questions about the purpose of life, the meaning of life, uh, to join me. Any of you that would like to join us, it's on Wednesday nights at 6.30 during our Wednesday night programming over in 107. But my hope this morning would be that any of us that struggle with the meaning of life and what's this all about could actually be encouraged from what we have here today. Because if you're anything like me, you got tired toward the end of 2019. And your life is just sometimes, you know, seems like it's just cyclical. It's the same thing over and over again. Or there's some brokenness or some heartache. Or even, you know, things like maybe there's a debt load that's got you down that's discouraging you. Or maybe it's just relational frazzle, you know, as you go throughout your your day and your relationships at work or whatever it is. It all kind of can get us down, and I hope that this will encourage you as we go through. I think most of us living in 21st century America particularly have this problem of overextension, right, in our lives. We we start doing too much or we get in the rut of an everyday routine. Life is just a never-ending cycle of the same thing. Busyness has actually become the norm. norm. Exhaustion is actually applauded. Rest is rare. And soul health is almost non-existent in 21st century America. 
A friend of mine, a pastor from up in Connecticut, say, says it this way. He says, welcome to the land of the walking dead. Most of us people around you are spiritually dead, living as though they came from nothing, mean nothing, and are headed to nothing. But here's my fear, that as believers, we've begun to fall into the same exact trap. Because we've begun to define success the same way that the world defines success. Do I have great wealth? Am I a person of influence? Do I have prestige? Whatever those things are, and the busyness of life starts to get us down. We're running around from one kid's activity to the next kid's activity. We think we're just bus drivers, right? Um, we're doing so much that we've created no margin in our lives for Jesus Christ. And all the things that we're doing, we're just doing them because we think we should be doing because they're the things that are going to lead to success. And we're not doing them to honor and glorify the Lord in the way that he would have us to do them. And then we get strung out. And so to numb ourselves from that, recreation becomes king. Entertainment is what we want to be all about. Really, one of the reasons why two years ago we changed our church's mission statement to living every day captivated and changed by who? By Jesus. That we shouldn't be captivated by what this world has to offer. We shouldn't be captivated by, I just want to be as successful as that person or this person. We want to be captivated by Christ first and foremost, and then changed and transformed by him. Well, the title of my message this morning is, Life is Meaningless Without Jesus, and you could really turn that around and say, there is meaning in life with Jesus. Life is meaningless without Jesus. Will you stand with me? We're going to read from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're actually going to spend most of our time this morning in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, walking through verse by verse in chapter 1. But I've got to give you the end of the story because without the end of the story, the rest of it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So let's start with Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we'll start with verse 8. Says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. You say, wait a minute, didn't he say that at the beginning? Yep. And after 12 chapters, he's still saying the same thing? Yep. That's his conclusion. But then he gives us a little bit of hope here as he lays it out in context in verse 13 of chapter 12, where he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good. Or evil. Will you pray with me? Father God, I pray this morning that as we look at this passage, God, that you will give us an understanding of how we should be living our lives. As we set goals for this year and objectives and, and make resolutions, Lord, that they would be centered on you. As we think about our emotional and spiritual and physical health, that they be centered on what you have for us. God, because we want our lives to mean something, and we know that that is only found in you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. You guys may be seated. So we're going to go back to chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes and spend most of our time in chapter 1, then we'll end up back where we just started in chapter 12. In chapter 1, verse 1 of Ecclesiastes, it says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. The preacher there, when we read that, that's the writer, the author of Ecclesiastes, and we know that to be King Solomon. There's been some discussion of whether or not Solomon was actually the author of Ecclesiastes, but to me, he's the only real candidate because he's the only one who ruled over a united Israel from Jerusalem. If you look at chapter 1, verse 12, it says he was king over Israel in Jerusalem. The other thing is his life experiences parallel very much the, the, the experiences of the person that we see there in Ecclesiastes. He's a king of a very prosperous nation at the time. He's extremely wealthy. Here's the bottom line. He's got more than you or I will ever have. More money, more fame, more education, more, more popularity. He's got everything. This man has everything. And what's the Bible also tell us about him? He's also the wisest man to have ever lived. First Kings chapter 3, he asks God for great wisdom, and the Lord, pleased with his request, grants him great wisdom. He's a man of great wisdom. Now, this man of great wisdom, who's not a chump off the street, somebody that we should listen to, somebody who's beyond us in all of, all of his ways, actually also becomes a greedy, lustful, power-hungry, idolatrous fool. 
700 wives, 300 concubines, harlots, doesn't deny himself anything. He just kind of runs around his entire life trying to find the meaning of life. But Ecclesiastes seems to be written near the close of his life when he's repentant and reflecting on his experiences, and he's offering some lessons learned, some warnings to his son and to those who will come after him. And how does he start everything, though? He says, everything is meaningless. Man, that's a little harsh to start out with here, David, the new year. That's kind of the point. Because he's saying, be careful, without God, it is all meaningless. You mean to tell me that my wealth is meaningless? Yes. Come on, Solomon, not my, not my job, it's meaningless? Yes. Uh, Solomon, you mean to all of those, that education that I've gotten through the years is meaningless? Yes. You mean every burpee I've ever done is meaningless? You guys know what a burpee is, right? If you don't, you don't want to. Um, every time I've ever run anywhere, it's meaningless? Yes, it is all completely and utterly worthless meaningless apart from Jesus Christ, apart from God. 38 times in the book of 12 chapters of Hebrews, he uses this word for meaningless or vanity. And he starts out here in chapter 1 with this idea. It's all meaningless because all of our activity is basically senseless. It's just the same things over and over again. Look what he says in verse 2. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? As meaningless as possible. Remember, holy of holies or song of songs. He's saying meaningless of meaningless. Vanity of vanities. It's as meaningless as possible. It's a vapor. The, the li word literally means it, it's fleeting. It's like your breath. So success, possessions, even religion, as he goes through all these topics, they're all worthless and pointless because they don't add up to anything apart from Christ. They don't last. They're fleeting. If our religion is just the thing that we do because we think we're supposed to, it's just as meaningless as anything else apart from God's um, working in our lives and our relationship with Christ. They don't bring ultimate satisfaction. Verse 3 says, under the sun. What's he mean by under the sun? From an earthly perspective, there's really no profit in your life apart from God. None. Apart from God, there is no profit. Jesus himself says the same thing. In Mark chapter 8, what does Jesus say? Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Jesus says, um, what does it profit a man? He gains the whole world, success in the world's eyes, but loses his own soul. No relationship with me, he hasn't lived for me, there's no abundant life in him. Nothing. Solomon then takes it one step further in verse 4. What's he say in verse 4? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. What he's kind of saying is generations come and go, but we're really not going to change anything. And then he looks at nature in this, in this cycle of things. I'm just going to summarize verses 5 to 8. But he says the sun comes up one day, it goes down the next. It comes up the next day, it goes down, down the next. It just, the sun goes up and the sun goes down. The wind blows from the north and the wind blows from the south. Wind blows from the north, wind blows from the south. It just happens over and over again. The rivers run into the ocean. They never fill up the ocean. And somehow the water ends up back at the beginning of the river again. He uses nature and then and just the toilsome, uh, the toilsome nature of our work as well in those verses to point out that we're in this kind of silly pattern that we get caught up in. At the end of the day, each generation is it's like they're running on a treadmill. Hey, listen, you all know that tomorrow's like the worst day to go to the gym, right? I mean, it's a great, the best day and the worst day all at once because everybody's there tomorrow. They won't be there by the end of the week. You'll be good, all right? But just think of the fight over the treadmill tomorrow morning right? Everybody's going to be on that treadmill. But think about all those people on the treadmill. They're doing their 30 minutes of walking or their 45 minutes of running or whatever they're doing on the treadmill, and they get to the end of the time on the treadmill, and what have they accomplished? A little bit of sweat, a little bit of energy, but they haven't gone anywhere. And that's a lot of what Solomon's saying. Nature shows us that that's kind of the life that we have. I mean, it doesn't matter how hard you work, the laundry's always there, right? It never ends. You can mow the lawn over and over and over again. The grass keeps coming back. Around here, it's January. Why do my leaves keep coming down? It's exhausting because it actually doesn't matter apart from Christ, unless God is in the center of all of it. You know, some of you guys have seen the old movie uh, with Bill Murray, Groundhog Day. Anybody guys remember Groundhog Day? It's February 2nd over and over and over again. He still wakes up every day in Poxitani, Pennsylvania. 
right? And he doesn't wake up on February 3rd um, because he's got to find contentment in life. He actually says, uh, I don't know what will happen tomorrow on his last night before he wakes up on the 3rd. All I know is I'm happy right now. That's Hollywood's answer, but that's not what's in Ecclesiastes, and that's not God's answer. You're not going to just find contentment in some relationship. It's not going to happen. Satisfaction and contentment only comes from what God has given us in relationship to him. Solomon goes on then in verse 9. Say, Dave, when's the bad news? Just keep with me, all right? Keep, keep with me. Verse 9 says, that which has been is what it will be. That which is done is what will be done. How many of you hate the statement, it is what it is? <laughs> That's what he's saying. Right there, it is what it is. That which is done is what will be. That which is done will be done. It is what it is. And then he says, there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It's already been in ancient times before us. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. That's what the wisest man in the world said. He said, listen, some people like to pretend that they're not the ones in a rut. They've accumulated enough that they're different. They've accomplished a lot in their life. They've contributed to society. And what's he saying? Hey, listen, all your new ideas... You might have a few more things than a few other people do, but there's nothing new under the sun. It's just not new. It plays out in our lives all the time. Just had Christmas. Got a new gadget, right? It's going to be awesome for about a week until it breaks. Got some new clothes, maybe a new car, new house, new boat. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a new project. Maybe it's a new initiative. There's a little bit of satisfaction for a while, maybe some excitement, maybe even some relief if it's something you needed, a promotion at work, whatever it is. But in the end, Solomon says, congrats, you didn't change anything. It's still meaningless. Then he answers all the people who say, look, I'm going to change the world. You know those people? I'm the one who's got it figured out. I mean, when I write on social media, people actually listen to the things that I have to say. <laughs> because I'm going to change the world. Or they've got all these great new ideas. And that's who he's answering there in verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things, nor there will be any remembrance of things that are to come. Let me ask you a question. Some of you may be able to answer this, but let me ask this. How many of you sitting here right now, right now, can name your great, 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 great grandfather? Five greats. How many of you can name your great, your five greats grandfather? couple. It's awesome. It kind of proves Solomon's point. There is no remembrance of former things. Doesn't mean that we can't get ourselves into the history books by doing something that, that the world is going to notice. Doesn't mean that we don't make some change. But if it's outside of God's plan for our lives, if it's outside of Jesus Christ, then it is not meaningful. That's what Solomon's saying. He didn't really change anything. Then, not only does he say that, um, you know, it's not just that our activity is senseless. He also says none of it satisfies. He moves from kind of this observation of nature and the way things are in our activities to now his own personal testimony. He says, look, here's my story. Let me tell you a little bit about how things were for me. I tried everything, but none of it satisfies. Verse 13. And I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that was done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. It's, man, it, it's a hard thing God's given to you to find wisdom. Verse 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. It says all of our activity, all of our things, they won't satisfy. They're just like grasping for the wind. Now, I've got three girls. They're all grown now, but one of the things they loved to do when they were kids, they loved to blow bubbles. They actually used to love to drive our, our dog crazy. Like, they blow bubbles and watch the dog snap at them, you know, kind of, kind of grasping at, the, at that. So I thought I'd blow some bubbles up here today. And uh, I went to the store yesterday, the Dollar Tree, and I, I didn't realize just how hard it is um, to actually blow bubbles without spilling all over yourself. So I went with the the Star Wars light, uh, lightsaber. That's all right. I spilled on myself even up here. Why did I do that? Okay, good stuff. Got to laugh. That's all, that's all that matters, right? All right, so like we're blowing bubbles, but I want you to picture this, right? You see the kids getting, their, getting the bubbles all out, right? Blowing them all over the place. Got bubbles everywhere. And then can you see the kids running around? See them running around, popping the bubbles? Grasping at the wind. 
popping bubbles. But you know what Solomon's saying? It's even worse than that. It's like you showed up this morning, and I was out in the parking lot with my shrimp net, and I was just going, Pastor Dave, what are you doing? I'm catching the wind. <laughs> That's what our activity is like. There's nothing satisfactory about it. It's like we're trying to catch the wind. And he says, all those things that you're trying to do for success, right? Um, all those things that you're trying to do, all you're putting all your energy and effort into, it's that crazy, the sports event. The art, artistic events, whatever it is, you know, the, I would say it's the triad of American success. Academics, arts, and athletics. And the athletics people think that the arts people are crazy. The arts people think that the athletics people are crazy. The academic people, they think that all the kids that do all those other things are crazy. And then there's those of you, like, you know, like I tried to pretend to be. Uh, it's all about balance. <laughs> We're going to do everything. Right? And it's... It's pointless. It's a lot of energy. It's like grasping at the wind. There in one verse, uh, verse 15, then he uses the proverb where he says, the crooked cannot be made straight. It's a metaphor for sin or brokenness. It says it's impossible. In our lives, we can't do it. It's going to take a miracle of rescue for the crooked to be made straight. That's his point there. And then Solomon goes even one step further. He's been seeking wisdom all this time. And then what, he, what does he do? Verses 16 and 17, what we see him doing there is now he goes after madness and folly, right? He's done the good. He sought wisdom. Now he's going to go, go, go bad on us. He's going to figure out if there's any meaning in that part of life. So look what it says. It says, I command, communed with my heart saying, look, I have attained greatness and gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also grasping at the wind. Picture the net. Madness and folly. What's he saying? Look, let me remind you I'm smarter than you. Let me remind you that I've got more wisdom than you. And let me remind you that I partied harder than any of you. Madness and folly. I did it all. That's what I went after. He didn't deny himself anything. Man, if it was in today's world, he went to all the clubs, he had all the women. And he tried it all, right? Man, if there was an animal to kill out hunting, he went out and killed it. If there was a fish to be caught, he caught it. He went to NASCAR races and hung out and drank beer and partied with the boys and listened to country music. And then he went out to L.A. and he hung out with all the superstars. And then he realized, well, man, in America, it's all about sports. It's all about the goats. You know what a goat is? The greatest of all time. Saw one of them go down last night. How many, how happy are we that the New England Patriots are no longer there? Just saying. Sure, there's a few people that aren't happy. But actually, he would have hung out with Tom Brady. That would have been a guy he would have hung out with, and he would have figured out what Tom had to say. I actually want you to watch a 32-second video from Tom Brady in 2005 after he won his third Super Bowl. Watch this video. If you listen to the rest of the interview, you'll see that it wasn't about winning six Super Bowls like he did and making the Hall of Fame like he will. He knew there was something else missing in his life, and he just couldn't figure out what it was. See, Solomon would have had the same experiences and come back and said, look, it's all pretty much lame and meaningless. Here's a guy, Solomon, who had it all, and yet life was not better. He had all the wisdom in the world, and yet it brought him to grief. He had all of the money in the world and the fun in the world, and yet it came back empty. You know, most of us have begged God for something through the years. If I only had $10,000 more, then I'd be content if, because every year I'd be all right. If I only had a girlfriend, if I only had a spouse, if I only had, uh, 
if I only make first team All-American, if I'm only the quarterback of the team, if I only get that scholarship to the college that I want to go to. We're striving after all of these things, kind of the American triad of success, right? We're just after all those things, and yet none of them are going to satisfy us. The American dream is really a lie. I mean, we live in a culture, if you think about it, where we have more money, entertainment, pleasurable experiences, recreation, and stuff than any previous generation, and yet we sell more pain meds and antidepressant meds, and people are more broken than ever before. Why? Because it doesn't satisfy. But uh, listen, folks, this first Sunday of the new year, there is hope. There is hope. You see, all of this frustration and all of this emptiness, Solomon tells us at the end of the book, essentially, that it's the purpose is to point us to our need for a Savior. You see, Ecclesiastes cannot be truly understood apart from this ending. Solomon wants to push us to faith and contentment in God because ultimately Ecclesiastes is actually about Jesus and our need for a Savior. Look what he says in verse 9 of chapter 12. I'm going to the end of the book now to chapter 12. Remember verse 8, he has the same conclusion. Meaningless, 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 meaningless. Then in verse 9, it says this, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words. Some of your translations may say words of delight. And what was written was upright and words of truth. Man, he took great care. He set in order. He took great care to put these proverbs together, to put these teachings together. And it says that he had words of delight and words of truth. And what was their purpose? Verse 11, their purpose. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. You know what a goad is? It's that tool that they use to prod livestock in the right direction. They poke them with it, and it gets livestock going in the right direction. In other words, these words are meant to sting a bit. These words are meant to convict us a bit, but they get us moving in the right direction. Because it's not meaningless if Christ is involved. That's what he's saying here. And then I love this, something that I actually um, was learning and and working through um, over the last last couple weeks, actually, is this idea of one shepherd I mean, it says that it's given by one shepherd. It's important to remember that the book of Ecclesiastes, yes, written by Solomon, but ultimately it's written by the Holy by God through the Holy Spirit who is inspiring Solomon. And that phrase, one shepherd, a singular shepherd, is only used four times in Scripture. And the other three times in Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel 37, then one that's more familiar where Jesus is called the good shepherd in John chapter 10. In all of those instances, it refers to the coming Messiah, the one shepherd. So when it's talking about one shepherd here, I I believe what it's saying is Ecclesiastes is really a messianic book. It's, It's calling out and longing for the Messiah to come because the Messiah is the one who's going to set in order all of the confusion of this world. The Messiah is the one who's who can make things meaningful. And then in the last uh, part of Ecclesiastes, verse 12, it says this, And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books there is no end, and in much study is wearisome to the flesh. That should not be the life verse of your teenager. Much study is wearisome to the flesh. It's right there in the Bible, Dad. Come on. No, that's not what he meant. In fact, what he really means there, if you read it through, is he's saying, look, he's pleading with his son. Don't go off on your own quest for meaning and satisfaction. I've already done it and tried it all. Do what I'm telling you. Listen to my warnings because it's all going to lead you to dissatisfaction and brokenness if you go in this direction. It's just, it's wearisome to, to work it through, so don't do that. He pleads for a different outcome there. He says there's a better way. There's a better king. Matthew chapter 12 actually talks about a, one greater than Solomon is here. Who's that? Jesus, the King of Kings, the one that we just celebrated his birth at Christmas, that's the one who's greater than Solomon, who's come with great wisdom and hope for each and every one of us. So he's pointing in that direction, saying that would just be weariness. Then in verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's the end of the matter? Fear God and keep his commandments. Now in the Old Testament, the idea of obedience, the idea of reverential awe was what um, would tie, we would tie wisdom to that. We say that's Um, how we follow after God, but thank God that we find out in the New Testament that the law's purpose was to be our schoolmaster. 
to teach us about the way that we should go, teach us about God, and to point us to the Savior, which is Jesus Christ. Because none of us can perfectly do what this verse says, fear God and keep his commandments. We can't do that. Why? Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Titus 3, 5, there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us can do this perfectly, but thank God for the Savior who can come and order our steps if we place our faith and our trust in Him. And then he actually talks about there's judgment coming. That, too, is supposed to point them back in the right direction. He said there's judgment coming even for the secret things in your life. It's coming. You need a Savior. What's the good news? Jesus lived a life that we couldn't live. He died the death that we deserved, and he paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. And if we just place our faith and our trust in him, then we can have mean, a meaningful life. And all these things that we, that we enjoy doing can be done for the glory of God and with meaning and purpose in them. When we set our goals and objectives, we can put Christ in the center of each and every one of those things. Because there is something new under the sun. Right? He says, no, there's nothing to understand. Look at what it says in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The newness that we can experience is a life with Christ. And it's a life that can be lived to the full. It's not just for our eternity. It's for the here and now as well. Jesus himself says in John chapter 10, in verse 10, I have come that you may have life. They may have it more abundantly. You can live life completely to the full through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So instead of seeking satisfaction in created things, why don't we find our satisfaction in our creator and redeemer, right? You know, then even the mundane things of life, like going and feeding the kids or doing the laundry, they can all be done for the glory of God. Those academics can be done for the glory of God. That dance class can be done for the glory of God. Your job can be done for the glory of God if we know Him and we seek after Him. Solomon says in chapter 12, verse 1, remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. He's warned him, said, don't waste away your life on meaningless things and meaningless activities because there's more joy and more purpose and more meaning in following after me. Now, you may... Let me just ask you this. Why are you here today? Why, honestly, why are you here? Some of you came maybe for the first time. Maybe you've been here, haven't been here in a while. It's the beginning of the new year. Well, I got to start the year out right. I got to get to the church. Listen, I believe that you're here. God divinely put you here to hear this message, to hear that a lot of what I'm running around doing doesn't matter apart from Jesus. You may not even understand what that means, but we want to be here to help show you what it means to have a life in Jesus Christ, how it changes your entire outlook, how it gives you purpose and meaning. And when we sing the last song today, we'll have spiritual responsibility, we'll have leaders, church leaders, pastors here at the front, and they would love nothing better than to show you how you can begin 2020 in a relationship with the Lord. Some of you guys are believers. You know Christ. And you hear this message and you think, well, wait a minute, Dave. If, if everything is meaningless apart from Christ, maybe I should be asking myself a question, right? Am I living for Jesus in every part of my life? In fact, I want us to repeat that. So repeat after me. Am I living for Jesus? You can do better than that. Am I living for Jesus in every part of my life? See, it should change the way our outlook. Are you living for him in every single part? Those parts you're keeping secret? Or those parts that you just don't want to give to him? The pleasurable things, the things you enjoy? Are you living for him in every single part of your life? Are you living for him in your marriage? Are you living for him every time you do a burpee? Every time you're out running? Every time you, you're, you're sitting there with your neighbor and you're speaking to them. Every single time that you're working hard in school, whatever it is that you're doing. Every time you go to your job that you don't like, are you doing it for Christ? What I'd like to have you guys do is just think right now in your mind, what's that one part I've been holding back? 
This can be an overwhelming message, so just narrow it down to one. In your head, think right now, what's the one thing that I need to make a difference in? I need to change. You can make a million resolutions. I just want you to think of what's the one part that I'm holding back from Christ. And then commit today to make a change in that regard. Because we want to be about living every day captivated and changed by Jesus here at River Oak. Transformed and changed because we know him as our Savior. Captivated by what he has for us. Not just trying to catch the wind, but living for him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Father God, I pray that in these moments, each person who's here, Lord, would would not think about the parking lot, would not think about getting up and going. But Lord, that each person here would think about that one thing in their life that they need to change as they head into 2020 and face the reality that life is meaningless apart from you, but there's great meaning and purpose with you. Or if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, Father, I pray that you'd give them the courage to come out this morning to one of our leaders who's here in the front of the church, God, and just tell them, I need prayer, I need help, I don't know how to continue to live my life so that we can help them in that. And Lord, if there's someone here who just needs to commit this year to you, pray, Lord, that they'd feel the freedom to come and to pray to you here in the front or pray to you where they're at. And I pray that as we sing this final song, as we reflect back, that we'll sing it to you in worship of you, contemplating and thinking about that thing that needs to change. That thing, Lord, that that we've been holding back and it's just meaningless and purposeless in our life. Help us to turn it over to you. God, I know there's so much in my heart and my life. Lord, be with us now as we sing. Help the people to step out who need to step out and come forward. We ask these things in your name.